Coming up on Nebraska Stories, nature's grandest spectacle, the last homesteader's tractor, a master gardener hangs up her shears, hand-drawn sketches reveal fabric and design, and a healing machine becomes a work of art. Nebraska Stories asked our viewers and Facebook friends to share their photos and videos of the great American solar eclipse. And did you deliver? We've received nearly 300 images and videos. You watched with your families, pets, strangers, people from across the country, even the world. Where do you come from? Houston. Twin Cities. And Southern California. Kansas. I'm from Austin, Texas. Where, where are you guys from? I'm from I'm from the New York City area. You are? I'm originally uh, from yeah. upstate, Binghamton. Oh, yeah? But I live in Cincinnati now, and that's where we came from. From across Nebraska, on rooftops. We're a minute or two away from totality. State and national parks, the back 40, and the backyard. This is your shared experience. We're expecting uh, a light show. We're expecting to be wowed, and we're expecting for awesome weather. Uh, we're expecting to see, what do you want to see? Yeah, just look, you see? Yeah, look with your eye. <laughs> that people would have enough interest in a natural phenomenon to come hundreds, sometimes thousands of miles. I think it says, gives me a, a renewed sense of hope. I've got this app and it's told us 10 minutes. Yo, I'm a challenge, yo. Homestead National Monument was ground zero for many, despite cloudy skies that threatened to obscure the view. It's still going to get completely dark in the middle of the day, so that's something you're not going to you're not going to experience um, cloud coverage or not. We are excited today to really host uh, people from around the world here at Homestead National Monument to experience what many consider to be nature's grandest spectacle. I just emphasize everybody how extraordinary this is. If you go outside right now, it looks like a regular day. It looks like it's going to be a day like any other day, but I can tell you, come 11.30 or so, 11.29, it'll start to get dark. <laughs> it'll just be a little weird. Bill Nye, the science guy, and NASA scientists watched with an estimated 12,000 visitors at the park from all over the world. Astronomers can predict this within fractions of a second. No psychic, no tarot card reader can do anything like this. I think it's important for all of us to stop and appreciate that. More than 700,000 traveled to watch the eclipse, and most of them were from out of state. The total solar eclipse, the first in 99 years to cross the entire continental U.S., resulted in the biggest tourism event in Nebraska history. Why is it getting darker? It's like one o'clock in the afternoon. Why is it getting dark? Because, because the what is coming. The what is coming? Let's be lit. <laughs> the eclipse?
2 o'clock in the afternoon. It looks like it looks like 9 o'clock at night. This is so cool. <laughs> it's flipping dark. The sun's gone! Shh. We're all gonna die. 360 degree sunset. Darkness. Yeah, I see. You can hear the crickets and the locusts, the squirrels. Can you believe how freaking dark it is? <gasps> oh my god, yay! It's awesome! <laughs> We're dancing on the highway 47! I'm so pretty! Totality! So trippy! Oh my God. Wow! Oh, put your okay, glasses on! Put your glasses on! I know everybody's been waiting for this moment. Why is a weathered 70-year-old tractor on display here, the place where the first homesteaders settled decades before tractors existed? Let's rewind the story of a fascinating journey covering 4,000 miles and 150 years of history. In 1974, a Vietnam vet from California filed a claim on 80 acres of Alaska wilderness, built a log cabin, and became the last person to take advantage of the Homestead Act of 1862. In a lot of ways, Ken Deerdorf, the last homesteader, was like the first, Daniel Freeman. 30s-ish men moving to faraway places looking for a new start. Freeman, a Civil War vet, came from Illinois to Nebraska. He filed his homestead claim on New Year's Day, 1863, and built a small log cabin west of Beatrice. Freeman had hand tools to work his 160 acres. So did Deerdorf, but he also had a used tractor. A 1945 Aulis Chalmers Model C. It gave him fits at times. When uh, Ken would be on this tractor pulling stumps, at times the, the tractor would rear up so that his, his back may have even been uh, uh, like close to being uh, parallel with the ground. When Deerdorf moved away in 1984, the tractor stayed behind, sinking into the mud for decades, until the Homestead National Monument launched a rescue effort funded by retired Beatrice doctor C.T. Frerichs. A rather difficult rescue effort. Man. Hey, hey, there we go. Oh, there we go. Helicopter to a ship, then a truck, all the way to a shed behind the University of Nebraska Lincoln's Larson Tractor Museum for a few weeks of work by the university's Tractor Restoration Club. We're going to clean it up some. We're going to try and stabilize it. Part of conservation work, you try and slow any future deterioration. Right now, I'm just kind of vacuuming to get kind of all the debris and the dirt that's been built up on this tractor and uh, trying to get all the rust that's kind of breaking off onto the exhaust manifold and stuff. This had a tree growing through right there. Oh, yeah. And we found this an hour before the helicopter got here. So it was a scramble to get the tree cut and carry it down the bank. 
And as you can see, he has an assortment um, file to a punch to uh, sockets. It's crazy that, that this is pretty much like all he had out in Alaska to, to do all that he did. This mud has been like airlifted. I have never been airlifted on a helicopter. This mud has had more experiences than I have. We'll do a little bit of prevention, some rust maintenance on it, and see what we can do with the seat, if we can get it slowed down a little bit in the deterioration. What I'm doing is I'm taking off all the moss that has grown on this wood. Right now, I am just trying to clean off like the black mold and wiping down like the dirt and stuff that's on there. We don't want to restore to an as new appearance. We want it to look as closely as it possibly could as to when Ken actually used it. When school started, you know, club met and they looked at this thing and they go, you went where? <laughs> so the students who helped get Ken Deerdorf's old tractor ready for this day got a history lesson. And the Homestead National Monument got what they're calling America's most famous tractor. Restored to its middle age Alaskan glory, Ken Deerdorf's tractor now has a home in Nebraska forever connecting the first and last homesteaders. To have this treasure, this tractor, um, at Homestead National Monument of America kind of represents a bookend. The tractor being in kind of the rough condition that it's in tells that story of him being out there by himself. It's gone through a lot, this old tractor. A little battered, but not beaten. Not unlike Daniel Freeman, Ken Deerdorf and the other homesteaders who often endured a lot in return for free land and the new lives that came with it. I bought this purple. Isn't that a neat color? It is beautiful. Gladys Jurink has been a master gardener for 37 or 38 years. She has been answering phones for Backyard Farmer longer than anybody else that we've had. And she is a true gardener. You know, just listening to her talk to people, you could tell she just really loved helping people enjoy gardening. I think it was love of the game. She, she loves to garden. She loves to share her knowledge, which is a, a beautiful piece of what so many master gardeners do in their volunteerism, and of course that is what Backyard Farmer is all about. It's a fun thing with people that are just starting. I just bought this house, and I've never had a garden, now what do I do? She is committed to outreach to people, and has welcomed people into her yard, and I think that that's part of what she felt with Backyard Farmer, that that's why it was so important to be here every week and make sure that the program was as good as it could be from what she could contribute. Gladys knew just about everything there was to know about gardening. And I, I saw it more than once where someone would bring in a sample and they would take it to the faculty panelists and if they didn't know, they would all say, go ask Gladys. And the answer, of course, was ask Gladys, she'll know. And of course, Gladys not only knew, but could give background about the history of that plant and where it came from and why it was important. She has a, a wide ranging curiosity about that and is extremely knowledgeable. And we are really going to miss that. Well, I don't know whether I had much influence, but I was there and I was enjoying it and learning something every day. You know, people come up with different answers to different things. And Nebraska is different from other states, so sometimes we do things completely different. People really appreciate something that brings both the practical level and the true experience down to what they can understand and they can do in their own home landscape. Gladys is simply at home, with her feet up, we hope, and, but she is still in her own garden. She's just a treasure back here for the rest of us. She, she just uh, 
loved helping people and, and loved gardening and loved helping other people love gardening. She, uh, she certainly has earned the right to enjoy her own garden as opposed to having it perfect for all the rest of us to see. In the 60s, 70s, and 80s, ads like these filled the newspapers and magazines of the day, driving consumers to purchase the latest designer shoes or clothing. It was the way retailers lured shoppers into the stores. And Omaha fashion illustrator Mary Mitchell was the hand behind those alluring sketches. I had about 15 retailers calling me and doing their ads, and they would appear also in the Lincoln Journal, plus the local magazines here. Retailers would drop off a garment at her studio for her to create a rendering. Mary drew the clothing consumers wanted to wear with the faces of people we might want to be. If you're picking up a newspaper and you see an illustration in comparison to a photograph, you sort of put yourself more into the illustration because you're seeing a photograph of a person. Whereas the illustration, you'll think, well, maybe I would look pretty good in that dress. While fashion photography could show every detail, fashion illustration was much more about highlighting select details. In fashion illustrations, the artist shows you what she feels about this outfit. And she may do a little bit more pizzazz or oom for more detail. Like for instance, if there was embroidery design, you would see that better rather than a photograph. While these sketches were designed to sell clothes, they also contain a high level of artistry. It's a true art of manipulating the eye. As an illustrator, you're trying to move the eye through the composition, just like an artist is trying to move the eye through the composition. Starting at the left, probably the rendering or the garments at the left, then maybe some more detail at the right, and the text at the right. Mary's late illustrations, she takes some creative license and becomes both interpreter and a bit designer, I think. You could almost name the fur, like you could name that it was chinchilla, or you could name that it was mink. And that was her talent of the detail and the depth that she could get with just using her 935 pencil in black and white. And she could get all that detail, which I think is remarkable. And these drawings were something Mary simply couldn't part with. It was a crime to throw them away. It was a lot of work, a lot of hours put in those so I kept him in my studio downstairs in a drawer. I put so many hours and time and work into this, and I didn't want to throw them out. I think it is art. It really is. With more than 1,000 renderings spanning three decades, industry experts say this collection is an important one. It's significant for the breadth of her work and that this work occurred in the 60s, 70s, and early 80s when illustration was in the mainstream of fashion marketing. Mary's wonderful approach to interpreting designs. There's depth, there's fluidity, there's movement, and there's energy, which not every illustrator can master, and she mastered that. While the retail world relies on fashion photography to sell clothes these days, Mary isn't ready to put down her brushes just yet is expressive. It gives me something to do that I enjoy. It's like reading a book, and if you enjoy reading a book, I enjoy drawing. It's a pleasure, and it's just a joy to sit there and draw something like this and, and think, oh, I wish I could wear that. Don't we all?
On the Garfield table near Stapleton, Nebraska, behind an unpainted farmhouse, stood a shed made of recycled wood. Within this simple shed was another world, a world made from an array of everyday cast-off materials. In the 1950s, Emery Blagden began creating a unique environment within this shed to help people attain better health. His mother died at a very young age from stomach cancer, and then his dad died as a result of surgery for lung cancer. Those things really did affect him deeply, and he wanted people to feel better. And in his own way, he really felt that the energy from the healing machine could help take away those aches and pains, you know, just to help you feel better. He worked on the machine right up until the last three or four months of his life, and then the shop was locked and he didn't go back out again. In 1986, two North Platte natives, Dan Dryden and Don Christensen, purchased the contents of the shed at Emery's estate auction. For 18 years, Dryden and Christensen promoted and cared for Emery's work. Then in 2004, they sold the bulk of the collection to the Kohler Foundation in Sheboygan, Wisconsin. The foundation was established in 1940, and the emphasis has always been the arts and education. Our expertise is in the area of preservation and conservation treatment. There are general truths that I think are prevalent with all self-taught artists, and that is they weren't trained in what materials to use. So they often present us with very difficult materials. Masking tape is a supreme challenge. The artist, of course, is learning as he's creating, and that grows and develops into something bigger and greater and better. Conservation is often a series of compromises and decisions that need to be made. Do you treat completely? Do you surface clean? And what our decision was to surface clean, to repair only as needed, that was an easy decision because to leave the shed patina on would be to expose the, particularly the metal pieces to potential corrosion. And it in no way enhanced the art that was plain old Nebraska dirt. To describe Emery Blagden's art, I think, is to talk about how many pieces there are and how difficult it is to take an environment, to dismember it, understand it, count it, photograph it, document it, and it's two completely different experiences. There's an intricacy, a delicacy, and then there's the largeness of it. When Emery Blagden's work was being conserved and it was uncrated and spread about, we had to call in a number of experts. If you noticed on some of the chandeliers, for instance, there were little glass vials, and Emery would go to Dan Dryden at the pharmacy and purchase elements. He would take elements from his pantry. Because this was going to be displayed in a public forum, all those materials needed to have chemical analysis because we had to make sure there was nothing toxic. It took up to two years of using modern museum conservation techniques to clean, analyze, and document every piece of Emery's masterpiece. Not all self-taught art is created equal. Some is craft, some is hobby, and some, the end result, is truly art, and it's, it's creativity at a higher level. But that said, it's all important. Some people might look at Emery Blagden's healing machine and say, it's junk, because he repurposed found items and created them with his own inner spirit into something artistic and special. Might be junk to you, but it's somebody else's treasure. And um, when it comes to the art world, I think people view it as good quality, inspirational art. Emery Blagden is known by art collectors and museum visitors as a man with boundless visionary creativity, an artist of great significance. Blagden's healing machine is considered great American art. Never underestimate what can come from a tiny, tiny little town in Nebraska in the middle of a wheat or cornfield. 
because there's inspiration and creativity at all corners. And someone who does work like Emery Blyton creates a Nebraska treasure that's respected nationally and internationally, and it's really pretty special. To see more Nebraska stories, go to our website and like us on Facebook. Nebraska Stories is funded by the Margaret and Martha Thomas Foundation. Sustained funding for arts coverage on Nebraska Stories is provided by the H. Lee and Carol Gindler Charitable Fund.